Oh, you're 12. So this is our second video on nostalgia, looking at the second and third stanzas. Um, I'll read the second stanza and then we'll annotate. So it was given a name. Here in Telebit, there were those who stayed put, fearful of a sweet pain in the heart, of how it hurt in that heavier air to hear the music of home, the sad pipes, summoning in the dwindling light of the plains, a particular place where maybe you met a girl or searched for a yellow ball in long grass, found it just as your mother called you in. So um, the, the stanza opened um, with a simple declarative, which I've highlighted already. It was given a name and this refers to the concept of naming nostalgia, of kind of coming up with the idea of what it was that these mercenaries were feeling when they left home and then they had an ache in their heart and they pined and they wept for home. They created the, the concept of nostalgia and um, it's an important uh, point because it brings up another theme in this poem which is similar to um, the themes in Litany um, and also uh, the cliche kid and it's about the power of language and the way that language can um, affect other people around you or it can affect the way that you feel so in Litany when the child swore the power of that word changed the whole atmosphere in the room in the cliche kid there's lots of kind of mixing of kind of cliche language and an attempt to explain how you feel and how the words you use to explain how you feel can um, impact other people so that's a theme that appears here it was given a name so this is a declarative very straightforward and simplistic line and it shows how powerful language is and also how powerful this emotion was because it necessitated the creation of this idea. People felt it so strongly that they needed to give it a name to be able to describe it. So how powerful language is and the power of the emotion, power of nostalgia. And um, it talks about then the, uh, the people who chose not to leave, to stay at home. Hearing tell of it, there were those who stayed put, fearful of a sweet pain in the heart. So, like I said um, in the first video, there's a real sense of the poetic voice being quite cautionary in this and saying, you know, be careful of wanting adventure and, and leaving home because you could end up being quite emotionally damaged. And here it's saying, well, people heard of this concept of nostalgia, of this sweet pain, and they stayed at home. But it's interesting excuse me, it's interesting that nostalgia is described using um, this not quite oxymoron, it's very close though, um, but this juxtaposition of sweet pain. Because in the poem so far, it's not really being described um, in any kind of um, particularly attractive uh, or alluring way is it everything was wrong when the men left home the money that they earned was dull and crude everything smelled wrong and they had aches and they pined and they wept so that would seem to um, illustrate the sense of pain but it's described as a sweet pain so that idea of missing home there is something there is something in the idea of nostalgia that is sweet because you for a second perhaps Imagine that you are home or you relive the feeling of being at home and then the pain comes in when you realise that you're not and perhaps you might not be home again for a long time. So the sweet, sweetness of nostalgia is in the memory. And this is very similar to um, Beachcomber, which is why I've, I've put them together. In Beachcomber, there's a great joy in remembering that, you know, lovely childhood memory from the beach, but also then pain when the poetic voice realised that, that that memory was fleeting and, and kind of reconciled to the fact that it was in the past. And here, in the nostalgia, there is a sweetness in the memory, but then a pain comes when you realise that you can't get home. So uh, the sweetness of nostalgia comes in the memory and uh, in, in kind of enjoying uh, that 
aspect of the past. I think we're going to do that in yellow because that's what the poetic voice is suggesting, that you can enjoy this memory of the past, but that it will inevitably bring you pain. And then it starts to describe after this caesura um, what might remind people of home. So it says of how it hurt in that heavier air to hear the music of home. Now this is the next thing I want you to think about. So in the first stanza you were thinking about stones in the belly and killing. Here I want you to think about this image of the air being heavier. What do you think that tells us about the air of this new place? Remember, the mercenaries have left home, they've gone down the mountain, they're somewhere new. Why is the air in this new place heavier? What might that imply about uh, either the air at home or the experience they're having away from home? And um, they hear the music of home, and the music of home is, is obviously triggering their memory, and it's described as sad pipes. So I'm just going to pick out that personification there. And just explore how that's bringing home to life. Uh, the music itself is brought to life and therefore the memory becomes more vivid. And it is more vivid for the, um, for the mercenaries. And um, then we're straight on to the next thing that I want you to explore in this stanza, which is this verb, summoning. So the music is described as summoning the memory um, or summoning the sense of nostalgia of these mercenaries. And I just want you to think about what the verb summoning implies about the power of memory, perhaps the effect it can have over you. And the music of home the sad pipes summons you in the dwindling light of the plains. Now, when I think about this dwindling light and the symbolism in the dwindling light. So, certainly symbolic. So in this new place where the mercenaries are, the light begins to dwindle. So if light is symbolic of um, hope and um, sometimes truth, then the light starting to leave is the, or starting to fade, is the symbolic kind of um, disappearance of the hope that these men had, that they were going on to have this wonderful adventure in this new place. So hope is fading. Uh, perhaps the happiness that they felt uh, is fading, the sense of adventure. So hope is fading also, sense of adventure. Oops, sorry, terrible writing there. In the dwindling light of the plains, and what is being summoned here, if we just read the phrase, summoning in the dwindling light of the plains, a particular place. So, the music of home is summoning, is calling to mind a particular memory. Something is coming back to these men when they hear music that reminds them of home. And then what you end up with is um, a triple of different memories of childhood. So, I'm going to explore each of them. So, you met a girl, searched for a yellow ball, and your mother called you in. And that uh, triplet is set up with the hyphen there. And each of these memories within the triplet is symbolic. So, not only are these men um, missing home, this slightly kind of segues into another aspect of nostalgia. People are often nostalgic, not just for home, but of memories of their home when they're younger. Nostalgia tends to uh, not just be about a particular geographical location, but it's often about the past. 
So these uh, three memories are memories of childhood. And they're quite um, kind of significant formative memories of childhood. So if something is formative, it helps to form and uh, build the particular thing. So memories that are formative of childhood are something that really becomes a cornerstone of your memory, of who you are, of your personality, of your uh, growing up. And you can see that they are the idea of romance, the first time that you fall in love. Searched for a yellow ball is the um, kind of relationship you have with your peers when you're uh, younger, so those important childhood friendships and the relationship you have with your mother. This is about three important relationships of childhood. I'll just move that over. So it's the relationship with a partner, with friends, and with family. And this puts nostalgia firmly in the concept of the past. So it's not just that the men want to geographically be back home, they want to return to a time in the past when these memories were, um, uh, weren't memories when they were actually happening. Okay, uh, final stanza. But the word was out. Some would never fall in love had they not heard of love. So the priest stood at the stile with his head in his hands, crying at the workings of memory through the colour of leaves, and the school teacher opened a book to the centre for youth, too late. It was spring when one returned, with his life in a sack on his back, to find the same street with the same sign on the inn, the same bell chiming the hour on the clock, and everything changed. So. In this stanza, um, Duffy introduces two characters to kind of further explore the concept of nostalgia. So she introduces the character of the priest and the character of the school teacher. Um, so we'll look at those. Um, but first of all, we'll look at this um, opening um, declarative, which is very similar to the opening declarative of the second stanza. Um, this, this, uh, syntactically. Uh, they are similar because they're both short declaratives, it's just that this one has a conjunction at the start. Um, but also they're about uh, the importance of language. So I'm going to highlight this one. And I'm going to come down here, I think, give myself some space. So I suppose declarative again is my technique. But um, I'm also thinking about how it is repetition of the similar structure, so um, parallel sentence structure when linked to the second stanza. So I've got a lot of technique going on there. And uh, oh, I could add another technique in there. Um, the semantic field of, of language, so we've got name and then we've got word. So, semantic field of language, any of those techniques really to talk about that. Opening line would be good. Um, and we'll just think about the next sentence uh, to further explore this one. Some would never fall in love had they not heard of love. Now, this is, I think, potentially quite a tricky concept. And it's the idea that you can't understand something until it has a name. Which some people, it's like a, a, a quite a common philosophical question. Some people fundamentally disagree with it, but it's the idea that once you name something, your understanding of it changes and you can experience it differently. So here they were saying that they had to give a name to nostalgia because it was such an overpowering emotion. Um, and therefore people could discuss it and could understand it and then people became fearful of it because it had a name. Here they're saying that it can work the other way, that when you give a name to something wonderful, like love, then people can experience the emotion, but someone never fall in love had they not heard of it. If, you, if there wasn't a name attached to that emotion or that experience, 
people might not understand it fully and therefore might not experience it fully. So that's one that's probably a good point in the video to pause and maybe rewind that and listen to it again um, and just think about it I and mean, do a little bit of research on the, the concept of uh, nominalisation when you give something a name. Um, but it's kind of what Duffy's saying here that when you attach language to something it gives it this power. So I'm going to add that down here, that language conveys power onto an emotion or experience. And um, the, so much so that people may not experience love if it wasn't a recognised concept with a name that you could talk about. And then she moves on to introducing her, um, her characters and we have the priest and school teacher. Now we'll kind of explore those together as a bit of a mini pattern um, and I want to explore the fact, there we go, down here, explore the fact that these um, these two characters are described with the definite article, the, rather than the indefinite article. It's not a teacher or a priest, it is the teacher and the priest. So I'm going to explore the definite article here. And this, to me, gives a sense of kind of significance and importance to these characters. It suggests that the school teacher and the priest are um, characters that you would see a kind of again and again that they're representative of lots of people it's not just a not an anonymous teacher or priest that they are kind of representative of more uh, more people so lots of people will have their experience so they represent the experience lots of people okay. and what happens to these people well they both experience a sense of nostalgia brought on by something different so the priest stood at the stile with his head in his hands crying at the workings of memory through the color of leaves so what has prompted his nostalgia is the leaves changing so the season's changing and therefore symbolically what that is is time passing. The priest kind of looking at the seasons changing is confronted with how much time has changed, how much uh, he has aged and that is making him uh, nostalgic for his past. So I'm going to put that down here. So this uh, colour of the leaves is symbolic. Lots of symbolism in this poem. Symbolic of time changing and time moving so he is nostalgic for his past uh, okay um, and there you go and then the school teacher uh, opened a book to the scent of her youth too late so she is um, not she it's a similar sense of nostalgia because she um, misses being young um, so in a sense it's it's also about time changing but it is brought on that is very definitely brought on by a concept of time changing this is brought on by a memory from her um, from her youth so I'm just gonna, my annotations getting a bit messy here sorry so this is um, it's also symbolic of um, memory from her youth. And then the poem ends by bringing it back to the mercenary that we started with. So there's a couple of characters in this poem. It starts with the mercenaries, then it becomes a bit more vague, then you get the priest and the school teacher, and then we're back to the mercenary at the end. And uh, this is the uh, next thing I want you to think about. It was spring when one returned. So the one that they're talking about is one of the mercenaries. 
Um, but I want you to think for me, please, about why it would be spring. What's symbolic about spring? Um, why might Duffy set this return in the springtime? So it was spring when one returned, with his life in a sack on his back, to find the same street with the same sign, the same bell chiming the hour on the clock. So I'm going to pick out this repetition of the adjective same. So just three. Yes. Now that should remind you of the first stanza when we had all this repetition of wrong, the wrong taste, the wrong sounds, the wrong smells. So when the mercenary left, everything was wrong. When they returned home, everything was the same. So there is safety kind of symbolised in that repetition of that adjective. Um, everything was the same and that was really comforting. So safety and comfort. But, um, oh and sorry, your, your final thing to think about is this bit here, the same bell chiming the hour on the clock. Um, I just want to know what you think is symbolic about that. Um, she's chosen things to describe as being the same, the streets are the same, the signs are the same. But why say the bell is chiming the hour on the clock? And then I'm going to end by thinking about this antithesis here at the end. Everything changed. Now what is antithetical? Remember antithesis is just when there's two opposites. Um, same and changed. So the antithesis is between changed and same. So that that ends us with a kind of comment about, um, quite a broad comment really about, uh, about time, how with time everything will change, um, about nostalgia that you might pine for the past but ultimately things will be different and you, you can't ever return to the same version of the past. Um, and kind of generally about as you get older in life, everything will change and there is no way of stopping time. So this is quite a steps back and makes quite a broad statement about lots of the themes that are going on uh, in the poem. So this tells us that nostalgia is, it's almost saying that it's pointless really, because you can pine for the past, but you're never going to be able to return to it. So nostalgia is almost kind of wasted emotion that time changes everything. And that memory is kind of unreliable because this person remembered their past being a certain way, but it has now changed, so we can't rely on our memories to give us a, a truthful indication of what we'll find when we return. Okay, um, definitely a trickier poem, I think, than we've encountered uh, so far. It's much more, um, I think, ambiguous because of the lack of a central character in it. And there's certainly, I mean, you can see from the amount of yellow I've got here, there's certainly less to say about the poetic voice. I think you need to come back to you know, repeating the idea that this, this poetic voice is adult is somebody who has experienced the world and knows how um, other people might make mistakes. The mistake of thinking that you can uh, leave home, have an adventure, not miss home and then return and everything will be the same. And because that adult, because that persona is adult, we get this sense of judgment sometimes, this sense of it being very cautionary. Um, and Certainly, in fact, we'll add one final bit about the poetic voice down at the bottom. I think everything changed. I think that really emphasises and doubles down on the idea that this is a slightly cautionary tale. So I'm going to add that on at the end there. But this might be one of the videos that you need to stop and you need to kind of listen a couple of times to a bit um, if you're not so sure about it. Okay, right, thank you very much.